Hey folks, Randy Newberg here. Welcome to Fresh Tracks Weekly. I'm trying to remember what episode we're on. I don't even know. Marcus normally does these, but Marcus and Michael are out fishing in a blizzard this week. I'm not sure if they're catching anything, but they're out there doing that. So I told Marcus I'd fill in. The rest of the crew is out turkey hunting. I didn't go with because turkey hunting has too many unwritten rules. They told me I can't shoot jakes. Supposedly that violates some sort of ethical, unwritten rule. And they told me I can't shoot them out of a tree. So I said, heck with it, you guys go turkey hunting. I'm not going turkey hunting. So that leaves me here to do Fresh Tracks Weekly. Now, with me doing this, you know it could get a little spicy along the way. But I'm going to start with the good stuff, right? The good stuff is, in the last weekend, uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation celebrated its 40th anniversary. They had a big celebration where they brought in 600, or not, they brought in 600 of their volunteers, just serious hardcore conservation people, showed up in Missoula for the Big Bash. And what they're celebrating is, you know what, in the 40 years since these four people founded RMEF, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, there's now 12,000 volunteer people. This is, this is like people who show up, raise, do fundraising, do the on the ground events. These are people of an, uh, above and beyond just members and donors. These are hardcore volunteers. So they got 12,000 volunteers, they got 230,000 members, but here's the work they've done in the last 40 years. 8.9 million acres of habitat has been improved for elk and other wildlife. That's a lot. And when it comes to public access, 1.5 million acres of new and improved public access. So, uh, really, really good stuff to start off with, right? We, we wanna make you smile to start with because the news often gets just a little, a little less happy as we go. And unfortunately, after starting with this really upbeat news about the Elk Foundation and all their accomplishments and their amazing volunteers, now we got to get into the category of politicizing wildlife management. And in prior episodes of Fresh Tracks Weekly, Marcus has talked about a lot of this stuff. But we continue to see legislatures mess with wildlife commissions. I, the authority of the commissions, the ability of those commissions to manage wildlife without political interference. Well, it seems like these states just got to prove that now wildlife issues are part of the spoils of political victory. It's unfortunate, but it's a reality. In Nevada, now there's an effort where they want to examine and scrutinize who should be allowed and what the composition of their commission membership should be. And then we got this Vermont operation out there, which I always thought Vermont was this state where serious hunters, anglers, trappers, all that. Uh, I think it's called Senate Bill 258. Tried to completely redo their commission, what powers their commission had. Uh, that one's out there. In Kansas, there's a bill that they thought they had it defeated, then it popped back up. Uh, I think this is House Bill 2530. This is going to change who in the legislature, the governor, attorney general, who gets to appoint commissioners and what the makeup of that body should be. The reason I bring these up is that a lot of people think, well, this crazy political stuff when it comes to wildlife issues, that's just, you know, a California thing or... We've seen it recently in Washington and Oregon and even Colorado. And a lot of people think, oh, that, that's not going to happen in my backyard. Well, it's happening in all of our backyards. So we want you to stay informed. We want you to be informed. And one of the great ways to do that is to sign up for a newsletter from one of your state-based groups. They have people usually in your state legislature. There's also a group called Howl, and their website, we'll throw it up here on the screen, howlforwildlife.org. You can sign up for their emails, and you'll get emails not just about your state issues, but also about national issues. So, 
Other things that are going on, as much as we're all waiting for our, our drawing results, May is like the month when most of the Western states start publishing their draw results. Uh, we're also waiting for the court decision on the Wyoming corner crossing case. Next week in Denver, the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals will start letting us know where that case is going and what their decision's going to be. That'd be cool to find out one way or the other. I think all of us are hoping that the hunters prevail. You know, they prevailed in the lower court. Hopefully they'll prevail here in the 10th Circuit. And the, the, there was a picture of this thing and it just caught me off guard when I, when I saw it. I didn't even know what it was. But I did not know that there's getting to be a bad outbreak of mange among black bears back in the east. Uh, you know, we always talk about disease, wildlife diseases. We end up with CWD, chronic wasting diseases, the big one we all talk about. But I'm reading this article, I'm like, wow, Virginia is seeing a huge outbreak in mange in, in black bears. And I'm like, well, Virginia can't have that many bears. Little did I know, Virginia, you guys got 17,000 black bears is the estimate in your state. And uh, then I find out that there's getting to be mange in, in black bears in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Virginia. So uh, it's, it's almost like there's never enough issues related to wildlife disease where most of us say, you know what, there's too many issues related to wildlife disease. We, we wish they'd all go away, but you know what? They're just part of the landscape. And, and as hunters, we got to fund the research and study of what it's going to take to help manage the disease part in the wildlife that we care so much about. Hey folks, I hope you like that news section. I forgot one piece of good news though that I, I, I need to talk about. There's a group or a couple in Wyoming that have started a pronghorn fund. More good news. So. Now I gotta go in the studio here. They're gonna make me do the deeper dive. And when you, you, you hear this deeper dive, okay, so many of you have sent us comments about why we should be for this, why should we should be against it, why it goes too far, why it doesn't go long enough or far enough. What we're talking about is a proposed rule for how we're gonna manage BLM lands if this is approved. So it's gonna be the deeper dive. Brace yourself. Sorry I don't have anyone else to go over this topic with me. It's just me, so it might go off the rails, but here we go. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you ever get tired of public lands, productive landscapes, and conservation being a political football that gets kicked around by politicians and special interest groups? Yeah, me too. So today, I'm going to talk about one of those political footballs. Before I do... I'm aware enough to know how people want to hate on one party no matter how good the idea and they want to praise their own party no matter how bad the idea. So I go back to 2020 when President Trump's administration passed the American Outdoors Act. There were some people who just couldn't give credit that was due because they didn't like that administration. Well, that bill gave us permanent and full funding of the Land and Water Conservation Fund, and that's something many of us had been working on for over 25 years. Yet, some, due to viewing the world first through a political lens, just couldn't give credit where it was due for the Great American Outdoors Act. And that's what I mean when I talk about conservation, public lands, and public access being a political football. You've heard me say it many times. I'm of the party of hunting, fishing, shooting, and public access. I don't give two shits about what party has the good ideas. I'm going to support it. And I don't care what party it is who promotes bad ideas. I'm going to be against it. So that takes me to this current game of political football that we're seeing. And it's in Congress is, is where this one's getting played. This game of political football would recognize it's a bill that or a policy that would recognize conservation values as a multiple use on the same footing as other existing uses. And it's going to bring or would bring if, if adopted a lot of market based approaches 
that public land management agencies can use. Now, many consider these market-based solutions to be the, the salvation back when the Bush administration started the BLM down this path 20 years ago. Yet now, because it's a different administration, these market-based solutions that are being brought forward by this administration are being criticized by the same people who sang praises about market-based conservation leasing 20 years ago. And now they're the ones trying to kill it, all because it's political football. That is political football, and it uses important conservation issues as the ball that gets kicked around. Not based on the policy, based on who's in office, rather than the underlying benefits of the policy that's being considered. And that's the stuff that drives me nuts. I was just back in D.C. two weeks ago, and it's like, oh, you people, I have no use for this political football. And I will use my platforms to promote the good ideas and to try and defeat the bad ideas, no matter who's in office. So, now you're probably wondering, Randy, what is it you're referring to that you'd skate this far out on the thin ice and expose myself to the critique that I know is going to come from the hyper-partisans on both sides? Well, I'm talking about the proposed BLM public land rule that would include conservation and wildlife values as a qualified consideration equal to the many existing uses of public lands under this multiple use mandate. Last week, I think it was, or the week before, or last week, the House of Representatives in D.C. just passed what's called the West Act. And this is an act that would eliminate the BLM's current proposal to put conservation and landscape productivity on the same footing as other multiple uses. It would mandate federal land agencies to operate under that multiple use idea. The current multiple uses we see are, let's see, we got livestock grazing, solar energy, wind energy, oil and gas production, mining, logging, and a ton of other activities on BLM. Missing from that list is conservation and wildlife values. Are we really that concerned about making conservation one of the equal uses when we value how our public land should be used? I thought Americans cared about wildlife. I thought we wanted more creativity in managing our public lands. What scares people about the idea of placing value on the conservation assets of productive landscapes, migration corridors, wetlands, and other values? Well, most of the resistance is coming from existing users, but also just coming from people who want to play political football. And so it causes me to ask why. Well, I get why some, mostly the public land grazers, might be concerned about protecting existing leaseholders. I'm the trustee of a, of a corporation and of a trust that has a public land grazing lease. I know how those work. I went and read this plan, and this plan discusses how existing leaseholders on public land, on BLM land, can't be displaced under this new rule. But I suspect most of us want to protect those who've built their livelihoods on existing rules, specifically many of the people who have public land grazing leases. So of all the concerns and criticisms I've heard about this plan, and people have tried to, to tell me is this or tell me is that, if we need better language to protect existing leaseholders, I think that's a valid concern, and it's one that can be addressed and should be addressed to the satisfaction of those people. So putting that aside, now I want to talk about all the other smokescreen BS. Other than the concern of the existing leaseholders, it's hard to see these other criticisms that are leveled at this plan that gives conservation values equal standing under multiple use. Especially when these people and these groups supported so many of these new concepts 
when they were originally proposed by a previous administration of a different party. Do the critics need this subsidy that comes with removing or keeping conservation away from being a possible value to these lands? Yeah, I said subsidy. That is really what it is. It's a subsidy. When one group or groups are granted exclusive use of public assets at less than market value, that's one of the many forms of subsidy. Or when one group or groups are not required to compete for the value of assets that they want exclusive use of, that's another form of subsidy. Removal of competitive markets. In effect, using government rule to pick who has the advantage or disadvantage in competition for the same asset, well, that becomes a subsidy for the chosen winner. In addition to giving conservation equal standing under the multiple use mandate, there seems to be worries about two market-based ideas, conservation leasing and compensatory mitigation leasing. Some of you might be, well, what, what's, that, what's that mean? Conservation leasing is not new. It happens on private lands all the time. It is going and leasing the conservation values or paying values in a lease for the conservation values. Compensatory mitigation is not new. It happens with, you know, the Bureau of Reclamation. It happens with highway projects. It happens with infrastructure projects. And it often involves going to private lands to replace the damage created by the infrastructure. It's called mitigation. And maybe it's easier to just use a couple examples of this. Let, let's say that we have a critical deer, elk, or pronghorn migration corridor that goes through a stretch of BLM land slotted for a big solar farm. Well, given the rare nature of migration corridors and their importance to species, compared to the millions of alternative acres that could work for a solar farm, shouldn't conservation-minded people be able to lease that migration corridor at a higher rate than what the solar farm might be paying? That's the highest and best use of that land that is the migration corridor, right? The government would get more money out of it. The market would determine what's the best use. Now let's use an example of the, the, the idea, and, and this one's so common, I'm surprised it's, it's even a concern. Compensatory mitigation leasing. Let's say a surface mine is approved in an area of critical sage communities that pronghorn, mule deer, sage grouse, they all rely upon it. So the company that is awarded the lease for the mine agrees that for the habitat loss, they're gonna go out to other BLM lands and they're gonna lease other BLM lands to mitigate and improve to offset the impacts created by the habitat that's impacted from their mining activity. This gives the BLM users the opportunity to use compensatory migration or mitigation leasing to offset their impacts. Because right now, the only real way we solve that, <coughs> litigation. Litigation doesn't help anybody. So why wouldn't we give a mine the opportunity to go and do their mitigation on other BLM lands. I have no idea why that's controversial. I thought we wanted government land agencies to be more creative. I thought we wanted more competitive markets. Thought we wanted true multiple use. Thought we wanted more solutions that have been proven to work on private lands. Don't we? Do market-based solutions that give conservation equal footing scare that many people? Well, it scares some people. And that's the head scratcher of all this. I see people trying to kill efforts to give conservation equal standing. And when they do that, there's a huge level of hypocrisy in those actions and their positions. In my personal life, I need all these resources that come from public lands. I like that public lands are a place where these resources can be utilized, can create jobs and economic activity, and provide us what we need. 
Yet the groups opposing these ideas on other topics and in other discussions, they often complain about subsidies. They complain about lack of competition. They complain that agencies lack creativity found on private, management, private land management. They talk about how they like free markets. They talk about how they want multiple use. But now when the BLM, who's been working on these market-based concepts for over two decades, instituted by a previous administration from the other side of the aisle of the current administration, now they come forth with ideas that check pretty much all those boxes. And we have these currently favored groups trying to kill it. That's hypocrisy. And it causes me to wonder how many people even read the proposal before commenting or before getting out on social media and carrying on. I mean, I get it. I spent a big part of the weekend going over it. It's 178 pages of some really dry reading. But I'm going to ask all concerned people who are emailing us and texting us and whatever, you know, hitting us on social media. Go read the damn thing. Okay? Actually read it and don't take the spoon feeding from this side or that side. Because the spoon feedings are usually a poorly disguised exercise of partisan gaslighting. Now, no proposal is perfect, right? But it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Some of the stories, rumors, and claims that have been made around this are pretty hard to reconcile when I read the actual proposals. Would this new rule change some things? Yep. Are those changes mostly positive or mostly negative? It likely depends on if you currently have exclusive use and you get to exclude others from multiple use, or if you are currently one of the people without exclusive use and want to see a broader concept of multiple use. I come from a logging family, so I'm 100% for true multiple use. Not selective and protective multiple use, but true multiple use. That's good for our lands. It's good for our, econ our economy. And it's good for us. It's good for wildlife. I think can be done in a way that's good for wildlife. Now, to this point, one of the multiple uses normally disregarded, at least to this point in time, is for the conservation use. The conservation values are oftentimes the highest and best use of these public lands. And if we really want multiple use, we need to have these ways, these mechanisms, for the many of us who are willing to pay for that use can pay for the highest and best use of those public lands. So, my request, and this is the comments I make when I'm in D.C., when I'm talking to any of the policymakers. Can we quit with the political football and do what's best for the land and for the wild places and the wild things? People might hack on me, but I'm on board with these market-based concepts of conservation leasing, of compensatory mitigation leasing, leasing. And I'm on board with giving conservation values the same standing under the multiple use mandates. And I want to protect existing leaseholders. That's not that difficult. But if you get in the world of political football, you don't care. You, you, your priority isn't those things I just rattled off. And I would say that any effort that fails to recognize the conservation values as part of multiple use represents a subsidy to those groups who currently have and who are currently fighting to retain their exclusive use of public assets. Those public assets deserve full standing in all ways for multiple use. I'm sure there'll be plenty of comments. Prove me wrong. Thanks for watching.